Hello, I'm Somi Aryan. I'm the founder of Fempeak, a fast-growing digital platform forging a new path for women to reach their peak potential with an integrated ecosystem of lifelong learning, career opportunities, and marketplace. My guest on today's podcast is Naomi McDougall Jones, a successful film director and actress who explains about the challenges of gaining success in the film industry as a woman and how to navigate the system and make it to the top. There's also so much that we can all do as the audience to support female producers, directors, and entertainers in the industry. Many of you may know that I come from the film and TV industry myself, and I can vouch for so many of the points that Naomi raised in this eye-opening conversation. So with that little background and introduction, let's hear from Naomi McDougall-Jones. I wanted to go straight into some of the things that you said in your TED talk, uh, which the statistics that you gave were so stark and so uh, worrying, right? So two things that I picked up from your TED talks that really made me, even though I knew a lot of it and I had uh, interviewed other filmmakers in the past, but it's just every time you hear it, it comes back to you, right? Two things. One was the complete lack of understand your complete lack of understanding of what was going to be waiting for you when you were young right and I was the same like and in my case I was actually I grew up in Iran so I came to the UK when I was 23 and uh, started a whole you know I, I educated here and started my business and, and built a whole and now I'm building this platform but uh, I look I had no understanding that I'm like I knew that as a as somebody who lived in Iran, I knew that I had limitations, um, but I, I didn't know that what was going to wait for me, what was going to be waiting for me. Yeah. So so tell me a little bit about that journey of you growing up and your and and I want our audience to hear more about it because I I think your TED talk obviously was 15 minutes and I felt like there was so much more uh, there that we could explore. And then the other thing was some of the statistics that you gave. Yeah, so I grew up in Colorado um, in the United States and had a had a raging feminist mother who's from Scotland, actually. She's a very fierce <laughs> Scottish lady. And uh, she and, and my father's also a, a feminist. And they raised me to un, to never consider that my gender would be an issue. Like they just raised me to believe that I could do anything I set out to do. And, you know, there's there's some privilege there in being a white woman for sure in a very white place. But yeah, I mean, I, I was always the smartest kid in my class. I always got the best grades. I, you know, got leads in the school play. Like I just, it never occurred to me that in, you know, I was born in 1987, that, that in that era, I, my gender would be an issue in the United States. Um, and... I got into an Ivy League university. I went, you know, and I and I so I just arrived out in the world um, and I'd wanted to be an actress from the time I was really small um, and sort of like, OK, I'm here, <laughs> like, I'm ready, I'm talented, I work really hard and just couldn't believe the levels of misogyny that I ran into the second I got out into the real world film industry. Um, and the first way that that showed up was really in just the total lack of interesting roles for women. And, you know, I would spend my days auditioning to play the very supportive girlfriend who doesn't really have a personality or the stripper with the heart or naked body number five, you know? And I just, I was like this, you know, I wanted to be an actress because I wanted to tell stories that mattered, that could move people and to, you know, to change the world through storytelling and in the way that storytelling can do. And, and the, but the parts that were available for me to audition for were just not even remotely that they felt exploitative, they felt boring, and they just felt like not what I was there to do at all. And because I was so naive in, in my early 20s, I didn't click, it didn't click yet, <laughs> that it was like a bigger um, sexist system that was at play, right? I naively thought, okay, well, probably just nobody's writing great roles for women. And so naively it was I was like, I could write better roles for women than this. And so with a with a friend, we set out to make a feature film together. Um, and I wrote the script and I wrote great parts for women. And it really wasn't until we set out to make that film 
that I began to actually understand what was going on because as soon as we set out to make this film and we'd hired an all-female production team just kind of accidentally because we hired the best people. We weren't thinking about being radical feminists. We were just like... And, the, and it's the people that you knew, right? It's like, that's the way that... Yeah, that's the way it works in yeah. business. It works in film, right? It, people, and, and that's yeah. part of the reason why men have been so successful because they've right. been having... Um, that network and and it's all about what we're building on fanpeak is is all about that is to create an ecosystem because there is a lack of an ecosystem for women right yeah. there's no there's no ecosystem and if we wait for it to naturally occur in uh, you know like through our history it hasn't and if right. we wait we will be waiting for a very long time absolutely and i think there's like a generational problem because you know, there were even fewer women who managed to get into these um, towers of power in the generations before us. And on top of that, a lot of those, not all of those women, but a lot of those women in, in the generations before us um, were still part of that mindset of like, well, I made it. So if I made it, therefore, it's possible for anyone. And because I had to work really hard and I had to scrape my way up, you also have to scrape your way up. <laughs> and, you know, like there's, there's, again, there are some wonderful women in that generation who have really reached down the ladder, but a lot of them haven't. And so I think it's, it's really incumbent upon our generation and the, those coming after us now that more and more of us are breaking through to make sure that we just keep prying those floodgates open um, so that it doesn't backslide in terms of percentages, but it actually continues growing exponentially. But unfortunately, I think there is a very good chance that uh, it may backslide because of lack of women's um, power, right, in terms of technology and uh, finance, where it's going. So when I started this initiative, I started it first as a think tank. And I interviewed hundreds of women who had succeeded in their uh, in their areas, but also hundreds of men. And, you know, to try and find out what was holding women back. And I, I came up with six pillars, essentially, that we need to build, or six reasons why women were held back. Um, and those were lack of confidence. And of course, it's a, you know, it's a chicken and egg thing, right? You right. you gain confidence as a result of succeeding, but then if you are held back, so your confidence gets impacted on so many levels, right? And we will talk about this a little bit more in terms of how the film industry has an impact on that. But uh, it was lack of confidence, lack of um, financial literacy, and, and the general big picture thinking about wealth, right? Because a lot of women tend to think about wealth or th think about money just as something to meet their needs. They don't think about it in terms of wealth generation and, and you know, like long term, because then then they can invest, right? If, if, you, if you don't have money, you can't invest, right? So, and uh, lack of tech skills, you know, because again, uh, technology is designed by men, uh, mostly for men, you know, and it, when it, even where it is designed for women, it, it's not taking into consideration a lot of their needs. So, um, so it's, again, it's like chicken and egg, right? The other thing is women's health, um, because, you know, menopause, uh, PMS, childbirth, all of these things, right? A lot of times when women um, are about to become successful in something, that is exactly the time where they go and have babies and then they fall behind and then they can't come back or or then there's, you know, then there's menopause, there's like PMS, all those things like affect their productivity and lack of business skills, you know, like film industry, it's a business, right? It's a business. So it's not good enough to be pretty and have a good, uh, you know, acting skill. You need to be able to to sell yourself and you need to be able to, or it's not good enough to be a writer. You know, you need to be able to raise money. You need to be able to build a business around it. And, um, and finally it's family and relationships, which is like, again, a lot of times, you know, when women are starting to gain success, um, that affects their family and relationship because a lot of times men don't really want that. And, and, you know, uh, there's that story of, um, I interviewed somebody in the film industry and uh, she said, I, I don't have the exact statistic, but she said something like 
women win the Oscars, uh, they are much more likely to get a divorce within two years. Whereas when when men win the Oscars, it actually uh, makes their relationships better. Yeah, which I mean, there's such a um, there's such a vicious cycle between those the the pillars you described and, and the system that creates and fuels them, right? So like the the last thing you described about family and relationships and also related to to having children, we've we've shaped a society around men's needs, and so. And their timing. And their timing. <laughs> right, exactly. That's why, you know, women's career clock and their biological clock is in uh, not in sync because the model of society is around male success. Right. Well, and it's also around the idea of work is more important than everything else, right? Your entire value as a as a human being is based on how much you can produce how much you can succeed all in the work sphere and so the problem is that as the gates of power have begun slowly to open to women we're still asking them to enter that paradigm so you end up in the situation where women are told they can have it all which is obviously a complete bullshit, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> you can't work as mm -hmm. much as um men are working who who aren't primarily responsible for child care. So, so you end up either in this situation where you're trying to have it all, failing at everything, <laughs> or having to make really unfair choices. Um, so there has to be a bigger cultural shift. It's not enough to just say, okay, we'll, we'll hire a couple women. You have to look at what are the values that were that have shaped the way we think about work and the way we think about careers and the way we think about success. Exactly. Look, I uh, decided not to have children and family, to be honest. You know, like I was I was in a relationship where my ex-partner was very, very successful. But when I started to gain success, then that became a problem. It's like, oh, you're going to be traveling all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. OK, but you travel all the time, you know, <laughs> you know, but but uh, no, I want somebody who's going to be here. Like this is the exact words. I want somebody mm -hmm. who's going to be here. And, and this goes on and on. Right. And it's like. The only way we're going to change that culture uh, is by women becoming more successful and creating. And basically, we are at a crossroad right now. We are at the crossroad where we don't have a previous paradigm. We do not have a precedence for what a society looks like where women are successful. We don't know that. Like uh, people like me, we are having to make a sacrifice and say, look, if you want that level of success, there's no way I could, like I work 15 hours a day and, and I have a big goal. I'm building this massive platform, you know, and uh, I have to work incredibly hard. And I have another business, which initially paid for getting this one off the ground, right? Mm -hmm. There's nobody who would put up with that. No man would put up with that. They wouldn't, right? And, and a lot of times, even if they say they would, you know, it's like, then they are not maybe the kind of person that I would like to go out with, right? So then it comes to, I guess, you know, un until maybe you get to a certain level of success that you can say, okay, now I can have all these people work for me, help, you know, help. But then a lot of times by then it's too late to have children, you know, like to, because like I say, you know, we have this thing of the biological clock and the career clock, right? And there's only so much energy you're going to have. I think we have to probably accept that there's going to be one generation, maybe two generations, which is us millennials and maybe Gen Z, that we are going to see this sacrifice. We are going to see this difficult time until we build a new society a new paradigm. Well, and I think the more of us that can build, can start, as you have done and I have done, start companies and within those companies and organizations create a different culture. And you're right, we yeah. don't have a lot of paradigms. The only paradigms we have are ancient cultures, where, which yeah. was the last time we had matriarchies. And obviously some of those lessons are applicable, but a lot of them are simply not, not. applicable to modern life. And But but the more we experiment, what, is it, what does it look like to actually give people parental leave? What does it actually look like to implement some kind of work-life balance in our companies? Um, you're right. I think we are the generations that have to take that on and, and figure it out. Yes. And it's going to be, it's going to be hard. Like, it's, and you know, it's not going to be easy because 
like I say, you know, we don't have a previous paradigm and we are going against the grain. When you look at social media, I mean, you talk about the sexualization of women in movies, but look at social media, right? Like that's supposed to be the free, free for all, right? But, and, and everybody should be able to choose. But actually, like, for example, the amount of naked bottoms that Instagram shows me, I'm like, I'm not looking for that. Why do you show me that? Like, I'm like, like, why do I need to see so many women squatting? Because <laughs> every time I open Facebook, right along the top, there's some woman's bottom. And I'm like, what? How did, what did I sign up for? Like, what does what? the algorithm think I, I am that I want to see this? Yeah. And, and that's, and that's like, when you talk about the fact that every time we see a woman on camera, there is a level of nakedness, you know, nudity, like partial of whatever, like a scantily dress, like it's the same story on social media. And it seems like that's what people want to see. Right. And it creates this paradigm of, you know, I was watching a uh, YouTube video the other day about, about, I was looking for like a relationship share party for our platform. Cause funnily enough, this is going to, this has been the hardest one to find. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, our confidence share party, she's an MIT professor of astrophysics. Like uh, all of the women in our group, you know, our board of advisors, they are all amazing. And it's been so hard to find someone to take on this family and relationship thing. So I was looking on YouTube, I was like, maybe I can find somebody who is like already doing that kind of thing. And there was this woman who said she was apparently a matchmaker of some sort and she was on a show. And she was saying that when women become successful, like in their maybe 40s, late 30s, you know, 50s, when they become successful, they expect to go out with somebody who is successful like them. But they, what they don't understand, you've got to just accept that those men don't want to go out with you. They want to go out with the one that's like, you know, has no cellulite. What she said was like, you may be pretty, but there are women who are gorgeous naked. You may be pretty in your dress, but there are women who are uh, gorgeous naked, right? And I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, this is like a woman saying that, right? Uh, and should I criticize her or is she right? This is accurate. This is the way that the society is, right? And what has brought us to that point, right? Like that, uh, you know, she was like, so you need to do the same thing. If you're a woman who is successful, do the same thing as men do, like just basically uh, be the James Bond, uh, you know, (laughs) character, right? (laughs) And I'm like, um, it's so sad that, it comes to that, but this is that that's the whole thing about there's no paradigm. Yeah. And I, I think I would say that she's half right. I think what she's saying reflects a certain segment of society. Um, I can also s- happily report that there are at least some men, and I'm married to one of them, <laughs> who, who can, who are evolved enough to um, be successful themselves and be married to su- a successful woman. And, you know, I, and I think there's a really interesting evolution happening with men in our generation where they are also in a crisis search in search of a paradigm because they also have no example of men who like they 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 know about toxic masculinity they know that everything they've been told about how to be a man is wrong and damaging but they don't know what but but they're in their own exploration of trying to figure out what it means to be a man man who isn't a toxic masculine it's like we are at a position where we could for the first time redefine that paradigm and and the concept of like friendship in a relationship right like to be to be best friends, to be partner, equal partners, right? And I don't mean equal partners in the sense of like I spent 50 quid here, you spent 50 quid here. It's like it's a teamwork, right? It's a partnership. But there the truth is that we are having more and more women who are gaining success and who will gain success. And, and I'm gonna make sure that happens because you know I'm building a platform to make sure more women gain success, more women. Um, you know, make money, uh, learn to invest, you know, uh, get into technology and not be left behind, right? Um, so as I'm doing that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm dedicating my life to it and I'm not going to let that go to waste. I've got, you know, another 
maybe 60 uh, uh, years in me, maybe, uh, oh, no, no, 100, it would be way too much. Well, maybe not, who knows? <laughs> I mean, you know, with, with really longevity. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah. I know, exactly, right? Like, but I, I definitely have another a good uh, 50 to 60 years in me, right? And I'm going to be, is, and I believe that one person focusing like laser on something, you know, yeah. like it can make a revolution. And there are many, many other women who are doing it and I'm finding them and I'm bringing them. I want them to be heard and I want them to hear us and collaborate so that we create this new paradigm. I, I mean, I, I worry about using terms like toxic masculinity because I, I just, I know that people are, people have become so sensitive about these things. It's just become so hard to talk about them. So I try to use very neutral terms, right? You know, it's like toxicity could be in both masculinity and femininity, because a lot of times women are encouraging that, you know, but that's because they don't know better. They haven't seen anything else. They, they haven't been taught anything else. There is a sense of joy and, and that like this kind of release of hormones when you succeed in something, you know, like, you know, imagine when you came off that stage, like the way that you were feeling like towards that, uh, towards the end of your TED talk, like I could really feel um, the, the vibration in your voice changing, right? I could feel you were so elevated, right? That's like, that's an amazing feeling. And that's just as valuable of a human experience as maybe having children who gain success, right? Like all that stuff. And and when I say toxic masculinity, I'm not saying by any stretch that everything male is bad and everything female is good. There, there are good and bad in both. And balance is the most important thing. The, the, the issue is that we've been so far out of balance for such a very long time um, that as you say, we're all swimming in this um, kind of runaway singular idea of reality. And so certainly women can perp can perpetuate the patriarchy. And certainly there are men who are work actively working to dismantle it. So it's not it's it's less about identity, although certainly men who benefit from the patriarchy are more likely to con to perpetuate it and women are yeah. more likely to fight against it but certainly those are only in broad strokes and and to your point about people getting tired i agree with you i think i think the last um you know 5 to 10 years particularly in the united states there's been we've been in the necessary shit of looking at maleness of looking at whiteness of looking of like really tearing apart these um these things that have been invisible to the most privileged for so long and so there's been this necessary like dismantling and tearing apart and looking at that is necessary and important but also exhausting and so i feel that there's this we're at this inflection point where we need to begin pivoting the conversation to to how do we build something else? What does something else look like? Because I agree with you that people are exhausted and 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 most people aren't gonna do the work to figure out something else. So so if this just gets too exhausting, they're gonna go, never mind, we'll just go back to the way it was 10 yeah. years ago. I can't think about this anymore. So I think it's incumbent upon us who are the leaders of this movement, of these many intersecting movements to say, to begin to change our focus to the positive. Can you imagine what it would be like if we didn't exist in a culture of scarcity, but actually existed in a culture of abundance? Yes, exactly, absolutely. I did a very interesting interview with uh, Professor Lisa Feldman Barrett. I really recommend you checking out her book. Uh, it's called uh, How Emotions Are Made. And what she talks about it, uh, about in it and, and in our interview, she said, the hardest thing that a human being can do is to learn something new. You know, like she was like, this is really, it's the, the most taxing on the body, on the mind, on, on the brain, and it's incredibly difficult. Now imagine if you're going to change culture, that goes to show, right? Like if you're going to change culture across the board, how hard that is. So there needs to be, and, and there needs to be people like us 
who are going to dedicate their lives, they are going to say, I'm going to make a conscious decision. I'm going to, and, and another way of looking at it, I, I sometimes give this analogy. There are people who are like the sun and then there are people who are like the earth, right? You know, and, and there's always going to be more planets and there's going to be fewer stars, right? And the people who are like the sun or like, you know, like a candle, you know, you burn, you burn to give light, to uh, make it possible for the earth type people to flourish and and you know like people tell me don't you want to have kids like you know you're so intelligent i'm sure your kid would be you know so intelligent so smart and and uh and i'm like uh no i don't necessarily think like they said don't you want your your you know genes to continue and i say you know what when i was growing up Nobody thought I would amount to anything. My parents were the opposite of yours. They were completely suppressive, uh, oppressive, you know, towards uh, towards me. And my culture was very oppressive towards women. Um, and my mom, I remember I told her, you know, like I have all these dreams and all the things I want to do. And she said, a lot of people had dreams. They took it to their grave. <laughs> I was like, thank you. How's that for? Her? Yeah, so... Teachers told me I wouldn't amount to anything. I had ADHD. I wasn't very good at school, you know. So it's like a, I had lots of drama growing up uh, with, with my parents and stuff. And I thought, you know, um, a lot of people thought I wouldn't amount to anything. I was just a kid in the south of Tehran that, uh, you know, had no money, you know. I was so insignificant and nobody would think much of me. And look where I am now. I mean, I've gained so much success. I'm like ahead of like um, in my other company uh i work with steinway pianos the most expensive pianos in the world right there they've been our client for five years i was talking to our client today and he was telling me how much their marketing and their uh efforts has changed as a result of what we've done for them uh, you know and and he was saying you know this year with the pandemic so many so many people went out of business they've had their some of their best years in terms of uh, you know their uh, the work that we've done in the digital space for them because we've kept them ahead of the game i'm the same person who came from south of tehran you know that nobody thought so that goes to show there are many many women and many many people out there there's like probably a kid in africa who is right now dying of hunger that you know who who has no uh, possibility no no opportunities who could be the next Einstein. Absolutely. So I think it's completely bullshit to say that, you know, that only my kids and my genes, you know, like my ideas will live. That's, mm -hmm. you know, that's my kid, you know. Mm -hmm. I'd like to think that more women would think that way and would think like my worth is not defined just by my kids and my family, you know, that, that my mind matters. You know, my worth is not just about how I look. It's not just about my body. You know, it's, you know, I know so many women that by the time they get to their late forties, you know, and the menopause starts, they start to think like, I'm not attractive anymore. I'm not wanted anymore. Right. I'm not ovulating anymore. You know, and it's like, like, honestly, there is so much more to life than that. And there is, and also everything in culture tells them that. Everything in yeah. culture tells them that they're no longer attractive, that they that they they become sort of invisible. I mean, this is where we get back to the movie thing. Yes. If you look at the percentage of women who appear on screen in various decades of their lives versus men, I don't know the statistics right off the top of my head, but for women, like the vast majority of female characters appear in movies and television in their 20s. It gets less in their 30s. By their 40s, 50s, 60s, they're almost gone. Mm -hmm. Whereas men, there actually aren't that many male characters in their 20s. They hit their, they, they're a lot in their 30s. I think they hit their peak in their 40s. And then it begins to step down in 50s, 60s, 70s, but there's still a lot of them. Whereas women, so, so what we are told subliminally by media is literally, you aren't even worth being included in the stories, in our cultural stories by the time you hit your 40s, which is horrifying. 40 yeah. isn't that old anymore. <laughs> I know. In middle ages. And, and uh, it's the same also in other areas. So our, like I said, our uh, confidence Shepani, she is a MIT professor. And she was telling me that it's the same in, in academia. Like you literally become invisible. 
mm-hmm. you know whereas as a man in your 50s you're like you're just elevated right, right? right. Yeah, and what this is saying is like you know you think about the fact that women live longer than men uh right because of the the way that our cycles work and the way that our you know our genetics uh, is designed so women live longer but although they live longer for more of their lives they feel or they're made to feel unwanted well and i would venture to say we're made to feel unwanted for all of our lives. I mean, because it's it's not like things are awesome when you're in your 20s. When you're in your 20s, <laughs> you're told that you're only as valuable as you as you look and you're you never look the right way no matter how who you are or, you know, because the the way you're supposed to look is literally digitally manufactured at this point. Um so we're just constantly trying to live up to a standard that is imp- possible for us to live up to and that isn't ours and isn't about us but is about being viewed by men yes yeah what's the solution uh well uh, movies right the stories we tell for sure is yeah huge absolutely because the stories you know it's all marketing it's all marketing and i i think there's a misconception that in the age where our primary story sources are film and television, that it's kind of fluffy entertainment. Like it's the thing you do at the end of the night to turn off your brain. It doesn't really matter. And nothing could be further from the truth. So the stories, because the stories we tell as, as in any society, if it's religious, if it's mythology, if it's film and television, whatever it is, the stories, stories are the language of shared values and, and framework of reality. They're the stories are where we agree on what matters, who's important, who isn't important, what do we care about as a society? And and so whether or not you're conscious of it, whatever you're consuming, your brain is accepting that framework. Um, yeah. And so until we shift those stories, it's going to be very, very difficult to shift anything else. Yeah. I remember watching the uh, hearing of... Um, you know, the U.S. Senate, when, I don't know if you remember, it was last year sometime, when they had uh, the heads of Amazon and Google and Apple. Mm. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. I I watched, it was five hours of hearing, right? Zuckerberg, all that stuff. And and they were uh, all on that screen. And I watched the whole thing because it's a big part of you know what we do and what I work on you know I'm a tech philosopher that's how I I explain right and and I'm looking at that screen and I'm thinking I know it's like in a negative connotation because it's there on a here uh, it's a hearing right but it's a great representation of who is running the world and I'm looking at that and obviously Bill Gates was not on that one because he had his fair share of that kind of thing 20 years ago but they're all there. I'm looking at that screen and I'm thinking, what does it take for me to be among that, right? Like among that group, you know, like we have been, we haven't even been able to have the courage to imagine ourselves at that level, right? Like I I literally, since I was a child, I started to have these visions of like me walking in this, uh, like in the UN, right? It's like in this huge, um, you know, symposium and then like people are sitting around and I'm like walking, I'm the one walking. And I was like, I was in Iran, this like kid, you know, that's, but where did I get that? How did I get that courage? And then as you are growing up, you start to see, well, that doesn't happen to women. That's like, no, but I did, I never accepted it. I was like, I, I, I was like, even when I was in a band, you know, I was like looking at, you know, Metallica and, and Iron Maiden, right? And I was thinking, like, I can see myself there. Mm-hmm. I see myself doing that, right? And, uh, and I'm like, even now in business, I'm like, why not? I see myself, like, I'm going to make uh, my mark on the world, right? And one of the things that you talk about movies, I don't watch movies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Even though I was in a film, I was in the film industry, I got tired of the i got tired, like for the fa- for the last since my breakup and maybe because my ex was in the film industry and i had to watch so many he was one of the judges like we had to watch so many things because he always had to judge the 
different, you know, the BAFTAs, etc. And I was like, that's interesting. Like, I just saw so much of this that since my breakup, I have not watched a single Netflix series or film. Huh. And then that's a, nearly two years now, nothing. Huh. And I think it has been absolutely beneficial. <laughs> it's been beneficial. And I know in your TED talk, you talk about watch films from women and yeah. yeah i'm you know that's that's a different reason for yeah. watching right but i know that if i go on netflix yeah. if i go on you know uh, if i go to the cinema i'm going to be constantly seeing these images of that i don't see myself represented in it yeah so i stopped I mean, watching film <laughs> that that makes sense to me that makes me very sad as a filmmaker but i totally understand and i i think my version of that is i I basically only watch content now by women or people of color. I like, I don't have time to watch another film by a straight, white, able-bodied guy. Like, I just, I've got that perspective. I understand what it is. <laughs> yeah. It's been very damaging. Like, I, I don't have time for that anymore. Yeah. And not that it's not a valuable perspective. It is. It's just all we've had for. Exactly. No, it's, there's a lack of female perspective in the top tier of everything. Yeah. Even in the even in the domains where women uh, like it, it domains that are historically thought of as as a domain uh, you know for women like cooking sewing dancing highest paid ballet dancers are male highest paid uh, chefs are male right highest paid clothing designers are mm -hmm. male right social media has unfortunately you know hasn't really helped i think it has actually made things harder but but the truth is that it's given us see i one of the people that i really like and actually when i look at my my role models in business they're all men because there aren't enough women in that you know level of where i want to look at um so one of the people that i really like gary vaynerchuk he always says um, that social media hasn't made things worse. Social media is a mirror of what we really are. I, that was going to be my response. And I think, I think social media is a real double-edged sword because I, because what it has done and particularly allowed us to do in the earlier days before the algorithms got quite so manipulative as they are now, but, but it allowed us to communicate with each other in ma on mass in a way that had never been possible before. So things like crowdfunding, things like um, you know political uprisings, things like uh, and I think the Me Too movement, like all of these things, were born out of the ability of a lot of us to speak our truth in a place where we could all see it, and and that gave us um, power and it gave us it, validation of our own experience as not something that was our fault, but as something that was, ha that was a larger system that was happening to us. So I, I think all of that has been extremely positive. There's also a very large corner of social media that just simply reflects and um, iterates further the worst corners of humanity and patriarchy and white supremacy and all these things. You know, one of the things that we found out was, so the way that we're building this platform is by cold outreach to people where we're saying, like right now we have 45,000 women who have joined uh, the initiative. And uh, it's at the moment it's going up by around four to 500 a day, but I'm working on, a, uh, you know, building that too. So we haven't done a single advertising. The reason I'm doing this and people often ask me like, how come you're doing it this way? And I'm very open about it because a lot of times people are like, oh, GDPR. Yeah, when Facebook was building things, you know, look, all we are doing is doing it and we are sending a, a simple outreach, no links, nothing. We are just saying, hey, guys, hey, lady, you know, we are, we are building this, this initiative. Would you like to be part of it? They say yes or no or not respond. Just a one-time email. Once they say yes, then we, they go into our mailing list and then we interact with them We bring them onto the platform. Now, why am I doing that? It's because I first tried to do Facebook advertising. What happened was that Facebook didn't run our adverts. It said that this is a social political issue. They wanted us to uh, to fill it, to uh, say a disclaimer that be uh, because we say raising women's socioeconomic status, uh -huh. we become so they're they're 
putting us into. Now, I don't know if it's a human, if it's a algorithm, sure. but basically it's designed like because it's viewed as feminist. I don't even think of myself as a feminist. I don't know what feminism is. I've never read, you know, I, I, I tried to read Judith Butler. I got bored with it because it was just too complex. I was like, why is it so difficult to read this thing? You know, I'm just, I, all I know is that I want women to make money and I want women to, uh, to be successful. I want women to uh, and understand technology, uh, design technology, build technology, because, uh, you know, I come from it from a technology perspective. I'm a technologist, you know, or a tech philosopher. And my worry is that in this century, Techno we are merging with technology. Look, I mean, this is now, it's my aura ring, right? My aura ring, it, it, it tells me how I sleep every night. It tells me how much, like, it can even tell if I ate too late. Oh my God. I wake up in the morning and amazing says, and like, terrifying all at the same time. But, but it's amazing because it, it tells me so much. But it was not designed by women, right? And why that is a problem, when I'm near my period, it says, are you okay? Your body temperature is raised. So I wake up and it thinks I'm ill. I'm not ill, man. I'm just like, you know, about to have my period, right? <laughs> you know, like it, it just goes to show, it has no understanding. And I've had it now for nearly two years. All this time, the machine learning hasn't figured this out yet, right? Yeah. Now, if this was designed by women, it would be different. Right. Well, and this is the danger of technology and algorithms is um, that it feels like they're objective because robots and computers are supposed to be objective, but they're only as objective as whoever coded <laughs> their algorithms and their, and their, you know, their code in general, which is predominantly white men. There's a, there's an amazing film about this called Coded Bias. Have you seen that? Okay. No, no, no. About um, I need to check that. About the way that racism is uh, coded into most technologies. Um, when I was looking for a name for FemPeak uh, platform, I, I was like, was wrecking my brain, you know, what kind of name, right? And I felt like I wanted to do something around mountaineering. You know, that's why the whole peak and Sherpani is and all that. But, but before I came up with that, I was looking there are these AI name generators to get ideas. Mm -hmm. And if I would put the word women, even though I put women, technology, you know, business, it gave me uh, names that had beauty or something like to do with like, or, or sounded like uh, women's products, like, like sanitary products. Like it felt like those kinds of names. And it, it, it had like something to do with the way you look or, Mm -hmm. You know, and and it's just uh, sad, right? And uh, yeah, so so I was like, I, okay, I I don't even think of myself as a feminist. Uh, so in the traditional sense, but I'm sure a lot of people looking at me and I'm like, head to toe feminist, and I'm like, you know, look, I don't know. I like, I, it's not like I read a feminist book and I said I'm going to follow this. It was simply that. It, for me, it all started with my breakup because I was I, I was invited to Japan to give a talk for eight minutes. I think on any level that is considered uh, a success, right? Mm -hmm. If you are being flown from the UK to Japan to yeah. give a talk for eight minutes uh, and they're paying for your business class travel and, and actually, you know, there was with Global Radio and, and actually one of their directors later on invested in Fempi. So, so uh you know, so they're paying for your business class travel, putting you in the best hotel, everything paid for, and you're going all the way there to, to be on stage and talk for eight minutes. And at that point, my ex broke up with me because he was like, I want somebody who's going to be here because this is like, you're just, your your career is taking off. It's going in a different direction, you know, and, and I was supposed to come back from Japan and go to Prague to have a debate with the Minister of Foreign Affairs about the future of work, all that stuff. And, and I was like, okay, right. Uh, so, and I have no family in the UK. So it was like my only family. I suddenly felt like I was orphaned, you know, like I was like, I, I, so it was so hard for me and it was so painful that out of that pain, came this concept of why as a woman, like if, if it was the other way around, I would be okay. But as a woman, like the moment you're getting to a point where like you have to travel for your work so much and you have to, 
you know, uh, and you're getting successful and you're going to all these conferences and it's like, you know, then, then all of a sudden that, that becomes a problem. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, that was so sad that, uh, that's why I started this platform and this, you know, initially it started as a think tank to find out why, why women are not in the, in the top tier, mm -hmm. why women not, were not succeeding. Uh, and, and I realized that I came up with those six areas um, and the family and relationship is like one of the hardest, hardest ones. Yeah. Well, I'm so sorry that that you went through that. It sounds incredibly painful. And, and also it's so amazing that you turned it into such a path. Yes. You know, I ultimately it's like, how, how do you, I've always been in life, you know, every time there's been difficult things, I was like, I'm not going to become resentful. I'm going to turn it into something positive and same thing with, you know, like my childhood my, my parents, all that stuff. So the point I'm trying to make is that I'm now looking at like maybe trying to going from a different way of uh, promoting in, uh, you know, particular uh, events, but basically my Instagram account is, not, they're not allowing me to put, promote anything on my Instagram account. So something must have happened with like, something must have been flagged as like, political or feminist or something right yeah, yeah. so now i'm gonna i'm I, i've actually created the facebook page of fanpeak and, and instagram with someone else's account and i'm gonna try going from the viewpoint of like um, promoting particular events but but there's a very good chance that that might happen again so <laughs> i mean that's a it's a pretty fancy trick by the conservative right in the united states that women's rights <laughs> and uh people of color's rights and gay rights are some, are political as mm -hmm. opposed to um, fighting for our civil rights and humanity. <laughs> yeah. A, it's a fancy trick that that's now too political to be- To talk about, yes. To talk about, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so tell me a little bit more about your, your films, where people can find it, what you're doing with that. I know about your venture capital that you mentioned. How's that going? And how can people support you? You can find every, all of my things on my website, which is naomimcdougaljones.com. I'm also on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I have two feature films that I wrote, produced, and acted in that are available on all the platforms. One is called Bite Me, one's called Imagine I'm Beautiful. Um, those are my films. I also wrote a book based on the TED Talk that we were referencing called The Wrong Kind of Women, Inside Our Revolution to Dismantle the Gods of Hollywood, which is available everywhere books are available. Um, and then, uh, yeah, as you, as you referenced, um, I'm a co-founder of the 51 Fund, which is a private equity fund to finance films by female filmmakers. Um, and I'm really, really proud. Our, our, one of our films, Cusp, um, which is a documentary film, uh, just won an award at Sundance and is, uh, Showtime is releasing it in theaters this fall and it's going to get an Academy Awards uh, nominating run. Amazing. Wow. Yeah. I'm so proud. And we have, uh, we'll be having five more films um, that we're investing in and helping launch this year. Fantastic. So as we are building these huge communities of um, women, you know, trying to uh, raise awareness about these things, um, what would you say to people listening? I, and I know you mentioned it in your TED talk, but for people who may not have seen that, what would you say to them? You said a few great points in your, uh, in your TED talk that I think everybody should hear. So I think the most important thing is to begin to notice what the systems are <laughs> and who they are working for and who they are not working for. Um, and I would say particularly try to notice that in media. What are the mm -hmm. stories you're being told about your value, other people's value? And do you actually agree with, with what your brain has been adopting from those stories? Um, how many female characters are there? What are they wearing or not wearing? <laughs> do they mm -hmm. have agency in their own stories? Meaning do, do the decisions that they make actually affect the outcomes of their lives or the plots of the film? Um, and seek out films by films and television series by female creators, by you know, creators of color, just, just begin noticing what these different perspectives are like. And once you begin noticing, you're not going to be able to stop noticing. And then you're really going to start seeing behind the veil of these systems, these stories we've been told. And, and then you can begin the lifelong hard work of undoing that in your own brain. And then the second thing I would just say is to any women 
like everything we've been saying, you just, you have to find a way through and like whatever it takes, find a way through, find your way into telling your stories, into building your companies, whatever it is that you've, you, that you are called here to do. Um, and then just trying to operate from a space of abundance and helping other women up behind you, beside you, um, a rising tide lifts all boats. You know, I think it has not been helpful in feminist movements when women don't help each other, when yeah. women feel like, well, I got mine, you have to work for yours. If we can, if we can lift each other up and understand that the more there's a tide of us all, um, the better it's going to be. And that's the only way that we're really going to make change. Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And as probably the best place to bring the conversation to an end. But um, that's exactly what Fempeak is about, is to get women to help each other because nobody else is going to. That's right. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Naomi McDougall-Jones. I hope that her words make an impact on the choices that we all make when choosing media and entertainment to support with our time, attention, and money. If you haven't already, subscribe to the Somi Ariane podcast on Apple, Spotify, or any other one of your favorite podcast channels. And don't forget to give it a five-star rating and write a review. You can also find the full video of these conversations on my YouTube channel and connect with me on LinkedIn to Twitter, Instagram, or Clubhouse at Somi Ariane. Finally, if you're not yet a member of Fempeak, head over to fempeak.ai, register, and join a community that actively supports women's professional growth.